The relationship between men and cars is a strange one. The first toy you're given as a wee lad is a car, immediately associated with an aspirational manliness. Ford v Ferrari revels in this appeal, delivering a sermon for the church of masculinity, using the language of the film, symbolism and sound design. Hear that? Even the title is billed like a boxing match. Henry Ford II v Enzo Ferrari, Old Geezer versus Old Geezer. But these names are not just blokes, they're also stand-ins for their automobiles. What are they really about? <laughs> Big, loud muscle cars. <laughs> they're called phallic symbols. So here's the story. American manufacturer Ford make cars, lots of them. Italian Ferrari make fast ones, but are in debt. When a merger is floated, some insults are exchanged and some precious egos oh, bruised. Big-headed boss that all his uh, smug executives are uh, worthless sons of whores. Tell him he's not Henry Ford. You're Henry Ford II. This means war, the dick-measuring kind, as both manufacturers race to create the fastest car in competition maybe not with the noblest of intentions. And we're gonna bury that goddamn greasy wop a hundred feet deep under the finish line in Le Mans. Ford create cars on a mass scale, factory lines of machines all making the same product. Ferrari is idolized for its sports car, its handmade parts showing more of a craft, a relationship between man and machine. In order for Ford to compete, they employ the only American winner of Le Mans, driving celebrity Carol Shelby, played by Matt Damon, doing his best Tommy Lee Jones. You blow a gasket, five cent washer. That's it, whole thing's over. Ferrari wins again. Oh, now that's aggravating. He in turn hires the emotionally volatile Ken Miles as driver. Who are you? Leo Beebe. Senior Executive Vice President Ford Motor Company. Mm. I'm responsible for the launch of the Mustang. Oh. At least now we know who's responsible. Cheer up there, Bateman. What's the matter? No shiatsu this morning? Touching me like that and draw back a stump. Ken is what they've been looking for. He will talk to the car, grease her up and find out her secrets. When Ford initially tried to produce a sports car in competition, they load it with data logging equipment. It's ridiculous! That apparently can't detect the problems that are picked up by its very human and salt of the earth driver. He makes a claim that contradicts the robot. Mr. Miles, if there's a problem, the computer will find it. Oh. Rips it out and makes his point by sticking wool to the outside of the car. He is the motor whisperer. He uses female pronouns when talking about cars and it genuinely feels more affectionate than possessive. Drive like you mean it. Hard, tight, chewy. He has tapped into its potential. He knows that she wants to go faster. You feel the poor thing groaning underneath you. Set in the late 60s, when men were men... Nowadays, everybody's got to go to shrinks and counsellors and go on Sally, Jesse, Raphael and talk about their problems. Whatever happened to Gary Cooper? The strong, silent type. That was an American. Jeff Nichols' The Bike Riders is also set around this time and focuses on men and their motors. Before things take a turn and get nasty at the end of the decade, it's implied that this is a golden age of masculinity smouldering and posturing, then duking it out to upbeat rock and roll, sharing beers with each other afterwards, but saying very little. Words just are, are not useful. In Ford v Ferrari, words are exchanged in disagreement, rage, jealousy. Getting it in the tailpipe from a Chevy Impala! But outside of this, whether affection, love or grief, it's spoken through the language of cars. Yeah, 289 cubic inch V8. When talking about cars, the lads can get rather technical. Front end and stronger rear diff to handle the torque. Now she'd handle a quarter mile. Well, now I'm not saying you should go drag racing, but uh, quarter mile is 13.6. Yeah, is that good? Evidently, too technical for posers. You want to run that by me in English? 
Sometimes monologuing in so much jargon, it feels like a spell intent on hypnotizing those manliest of men. possibility that the drain hose is kinked, but I can put that into writing for you after a more thorough inspection. The clutch plate is no longer a plate, and the switch striker is neither switching nor striking. This talk is also employed as a form of emotional avoidance. These blokes would rather throw down than talk about their feelings. Like when Ken first finds out that he won't be joining the team in France. It is their opinion that you are not a good image, so you cannot drive their race car. These scenes could have emotional subtitles for the uninitiated. I'm going to reroute the oil line. If there's spillage, it could drip. Ken. Tell the boys to watch their pace come sunrise. The, uh, the gearbox will overheat. Outside of the business of racing, the only glimpse of private life comes in the form of Ken Miles and his family. The first time we see his wife, help you, miss. she engages in a form of seductive role play. Wasn't that an MGA 1500? In which she uses the language. Ah, you know you can't. The only female character in the film, she is idealized. Oh, am I? Am I? Later, when she angrily confronts Ken, she uses the only tool she knows will work, the car. I thought we loved this shit. What? They have a son, who we only see in relation to his father's racing. Young Peter plays with Scale Electric, has his father's trophies under his bed, and drawings of Le Mans over the floor. This bond of father and son is cloaked in the talk of cars, and at times takes on a quasi-spiritual quality. The film opens with Shelby waxing spiritual in voiceover, about the speed at which a driver experiences transcendence. There's a point, 7,000 RPM, where everything fades. Which feels rather arbitrary. At this point, apparently, the car ceases to be and the man is just floating in space. Ken and Peter sit beneath the stars, pondering the existence of a hypothetical circuit. Out there is the perfect lap as though it's some mystical event. No mistakes. Every gear change, every corner. It feels biblical, even. You see it? I think so. Ken teaches his son about life through his relationship to cars. He is raising him in his likeness, and throughout the film, we catch hints of his development, until we hear the result of this indoctrination. She looks pretty good. At which point Ken is taken from this world to the rainbow road in the sky. Early in the film, Carol and Ken fight. Excuse me. During this fight, Ken throws a spanner, or wrench if you're American, at Carol's head. You know, boys being boys. When he wins the race, it becomes a holy totem and is revered as such, boxed and framed. Struggling to come to terms with Ken's death. What does that mean? It's been six months, Shell. Maybe because he doesn't have an outlet, what with crying being a weakness played for comedy, he sees his old friend in the objects around him, which reminds him to check in on Ken's family, something that he has been putting off, and so he takes with him the symbolic gift of the wrench. Before handing down this phallic baton, he explains in the most masculine of ways that it is more consoling than words. Tools are useful because you can make stuff with them and you can fix stuff with them. Thanks. Before the film even begins, we hear the roar of engines. This sound is constant throughout the film, humming and vibrating with varying intensity, growing with the tension of each race, effectively working just like a score. We call it the beast. More than this though, the noise becomes a practical tool in more ways than one. At the beginning of the film, Shelby is told that he could suffer a cardiac arrest, and so he shuts his eyes and listens to the purr of the engine to bring down his elevated heart rate, as though the car stabilizes him. This is mirrored in the final moment of the film. Just after handing down the wrench and awkwardly waving to Ken's wife. What's he doing? <laughs> Shelby returns to his car, and enters the same meditative state. He is still for a moment, and tears form in his eyes, 
and as he tries to compose himself, there is the abrupt, grief-cancelling noise of the engine. He wipes away his sadness, drops his sunglasses and drives off into the distance, swinging his car around into traffic, bringing us full circle from the beginning. He may have lost a friend, but he still has his car. <laughs>